What filters are you applying in your life? Why do we hold more preference, or seem to hold more preference, on perception than reality? B to B and B to C is, in essence, H to H. Human to human. Got it in. But we seem to forget that. We live in a generation where we're only a click away from falsehood. Crafty angle, great lighting, sucking the cheeks, and even the most challenging of models <laughs> can look half decent. <laughs> we live in an Instagram generation where normal is to display the, the very best image that we can of ourselves, regardless of whether it's authentic. But it's not just the Instagram generation that use filters. They didn't invent it. Who here, this is our audience participation time, who here is in a customer or a client facing role at work? Put your hands up. A role that sees you interacting with people on a daily basis. Yeah, quite a few of you. That means I can carry on, that's good. So within that role, how honest are you to those people? Some of you are gonna say, well, yeah, 100%. It goes against the very fabric of, of my nature to not be honest. But is that accurate? How do you answer this question? How are you today? Now I'm guessing, yeah, all right, you, or something like that. Even when you've had a bad day? Anyone honest? When someone asks you that question, you've had a real crappy day? Well, cheers for asking, but no, it's been a bad day. You're the 37th call I've made, and everyone's just shouted at me. My bunions are playing up, and some twerps nicked my clearly labelled sandwich from the staff canteen. Now, I'm not, making, I'm not suggesting that being brutally honest to that level every day, every time, is going to be good for business. But it is a filter we wear, isn't it? In 2010, I joined a firm, a company that was going to prove, in, in hindsight, to be a very pivotal uh, journey of my life. I joined a firm where uh, I received a salary at the start on a, on a support desk, answering phones, telling people to turn it off and back on again, of about 12 to 13,000 uh, pounds, with a 500 pound bonus, uh, bonus if I attended all the time. Within three and a half years, I was handed a cheque for a quarter of a million pound. I was given a directorship. I was given the responsibility of setting up a new business, a new arm of the company, and all the responsibilities that go with that. I became Mr. Flashy McFlashy Dick. I was God's gift to everyone, to no one, but I told everyone I was. You see, I joined a firm where perception played a bigger part than reality. To be successful, you had to tell people you were successful, show people you were successful. You're on my mind. Uh, show people you were successful. So we're gonna be regretting that. Um, show people that you were successful. I was painting such a, a false picture of what I wanted to become, sorry, who I thought I wanted to become, that I started to believe it. The humble braggy images shared on a, a docky soap image stream on my Instagram feed. The perfect lifestyle. The, oh, traffic's so bad with more of the image of my steering wheel and its badge than the road ahead. <laughs> Sitting next to my chairman's Rolls Royce, he had a very nice Rolls Royce, making it look like I was about to go for a drive. I was faking it till I was trying to make it. About 18 months later, that dream came to an end. That business fell flat on its filtered face and the cracks of my filter, uh, well, they were showing. I started on a bit of a journey. And I think we've probably all been there at some point in our life where the dark cloud comes over. The end of 2015, I was given a ultimatum. I could go and find a quarter of a million quid out the back of my sofa, give it back, and buy the company, essentially, 
which was a real good offer considering I didn't have that and the company wasn't making any money, I could go back to my previous role and pick up phones and tell you to turn it off and back on again. Or I could walk away. Now, because that cloud was starting to come over, I had a decision to make. And I knew that if I had made the wrong decision, that cloud wasn't just going to come over. It was going to be all encompassing. It was going to take me. And I'd been in that exact position before. In 2010, now, I'm glad you're all sitting down because what I'm about to tell you might shock some of you. I was a police officer, believe it or not. Sorry, not in 2010, 2001. 2001, I was a police officer. Got me one and the zero wrong way around. I was a police officer of West Midlands Police Force. And, uh, well, I was rubbish at it, if I'm being brutally honest. Um, a lot of people say, why did you leave, Chris? Mm, I was crap. Um, now, uh, we've, we've heard different talkers talk about, the, or different speakers talk about experience that they've had. And, and the experience I had in the police while it did form and create me as a human being a little bit more, it also broke me. And after dealing with more than one, um, would be two, more than one really bad uh, situation, I started to spiral. I started to drink. I'm good at drinking. I found out. Really good at drinking. And after three years of being in West Mids, I found myself sat on a road bridge overlooking the Birmingham to Coventry train line. Now they say you can remember experiences, feelings of events that touch you. The overwhelming feeling that I had of that time was just how numb my ass was. <laughs> the pins and needles were distracting to say the least. <laughs> I was also getting very angry with myself because I was trying to count how long it took from when I saw the train come around the corner to when it got to there. So when I jumped, it would hit me. Now, whether this is a laughing moment or not, I'd also got the image of me missing, landing on the train and then trying to, to explain why I'm on the top of a train at Birmingham New Street. <laughs> I wasn't really thinking clearly, as you can probably tell. Now, sat there and, and counting that and getting frustrated myself, everything went quiet. I couldn't hear trains anymore. I couldn't hear the cars. I couldn't hear the kids playing at the junior school a few, few streets across. And I shuffled closer. And then my bloody phone rang. <laughs> and then it rang again. And I kept ignoring it. I kept ignoring it. You know when someone just doesn't give up, and then you angry answer? We, I had to flip it, it was one of those phones. Um, and the, the time I picked it out of my pocket, it was a text message. And my mum had rang four or five times, she'd left a text. Call me when you can. Love mum. Kiss. Being pissed off, closed it, put it back in my pocket, shuffled up. Then it hit me. Not, not the train. <laughs> Knowing what I know from being in the police, any suicide, there's an inquest. Part of that inquest would be to look at technologies and any messages, emails, phone calls, anything like that. When they find what's left of me and look at my phone records, they're going to know. I did that. I did that. I did that. I did that. What if my mum found out? I would kill her. It took me close to two years to get from under that cloud. Uh, lots of therapists, cognitive behavioural therapy, and enough tablets to make me sound like a TikTok pack. Tick tack, not TikTok pack. <laughs> But I did climb out of that. Now, I was forgetting something from back then that was happening in my life at this stage. And it was something that one of my, the therapist that, that was delivering the, the CBT told me. And he says, Chris, 
you know when you stop pretending and you start loving yourself a little bit and you start accepting who you are and you remove all these barriers that you put up to protect yourself, when you're unapologetically yourself, life's not bad. And I was forgetting that. So I had a decision to make in uh, 2015. I could dig down behind the sofa, find a quarter of a million quid. There wasn't. Um, I tried. I could go back to the previous role and, and go back to the very team and people that I worked my ass off to escape from. Or I could just say, you know what? This isn't for me. I've got to do something else. Uh, and I did, obviously, I'm here. Um, so, hindsight, the decision I took that day to leave the, 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 the business um, was probably the, the, the most stupidest decision at the time I could have made. I got a five-month-old and a seven-year-old and a partner who hated me for the decision. Um, because we only had two months savings. But in hindsight, and everyone likes a happy ending, not referencing yours there, everyone likes a happy ending, um, it, it turned out to be the best decision of my life. So what's uh, me playing catch with a train, filters and an Instagram generation got to do with this talk? Well, you know when I said it's not just about the Instagram generation, it's not just those folks that use filters. We all do. Who here? I really hope people put their hands up. He's on LinkedIn. Yes. Right. You will no doubt have seen on LinkedIn creative job titles. Meet Hannah. Hannah is the CEO of her own design studio. She is founder and director. She is crafting the awesome. She's a designer. Meet Dave. Dave is a talent exporter, a visionaire of the potential. He is helping people find their purpose. Well, he's a, he's a recruiter, isn't he? <laughs> it's not just LinkedIn. It's not just Instagram. Who here, and I'm not going to make you stand up and point at you in shame, but who here has ever written an email that starts with, I hope this email finds you well. <laughs> Put your hands up, come on, who are you? There we go, thank you. Can you imagine if you did that face to face? I hope my face finds you well. <laughs> you sound like Crichton from Red Dwarf. Ever uttered the words, reach out? Let's circle back on that. Let's put our collective brains together and do some blue sky thinking. Really? It's like the, the office filter. We, we, we put a suit on and we walk through the door and all of a sudden, ooh. <laughs> now, I know I'm making light of, of the filters that we apply and, and the things that we say. And there's probably people here right now that are looking at me and going, how the hell did he go talk? And thinking, <laughs> well, I don't apply filters to my life. Do you not? A little exercise for you to play with. What would your mum or dad describe you as? <laughs> Some people might know where I'm going with this. <laughs> what would your friends describe you as? What would your boss or your colleagues describe you as? What would your lover describe you as? Now I'm guessing all a little bit differently. The challenge here is to match those with what you describe yourself as. To new acquaintances, to new people, to people we've not yet known properly. Are they all the same? Anyone want to admit they're all the same? We tend to protect ourselves from the things we don't yet know by 
allowing certain dominant parts of our character to shine through until we get to know that person. And there's nothing wrong with that, is there? Can't harm us. I'm going to suggest, though, that there are some people out there that may well use those sort of filters in exactly the same way as Flashy McFlashy Dick did here to paint a less than real picture of who they are, to show that you're a little bit more successful, a little more better. And if, and if that is you, then why? What's more important than reality? We've got to pretend. Why do we need to put these filters on for other people to accept who we are? That's a bit of a damning state of affairs, isn't it? Now, if you take anything away from this talk, or lecture, it's more of a lecture, um, I'd like it to be the following. Let's do a bit of self-reflection. What filters am I applying in my life? What am I doing online, which is different to offline? When I'm giving somebody the air kisses, mm, it's lovely to see you. Is that really you? Or would you rather go, oh, no. <laughs> yeah? Because when you are honest with yourself, when you're happy with who you are, when you're happy with the, the image of, of you facing the world, or better still, you don't really care too much about that. Life. Well, it becomes easier and better. I thank you.